Well, Lisa told me I had to tell a story today, um, and so I, I don't really know any good stories, so I decided to tell you uh, the story of my research group uh, at the Computation Institute um, uh, and the Center for Robust Decision Making and Climate Energy Policy, um, and how we went, uh, starting eight years ago, how we went from uh, studying global change to studying uh, sort of re resilience in the food system, and hopefully learning a few lessons here and there, both about research, about the food system, uh, about feeding, every, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll get back to the title in a second. Um, because I know I'm going to run out of time and get chased out of sta off the stage before I finish my slides, I'm going to go ahead and give you the, the lesson up front. So spoiler alert. Uh, this is going to be a story basically about scales. It's going to be a story about the transition of research from from very large um, global scale phenomena that act on multi-decadal time scales and affect the planet long, a long time in the future, um, down to, to, to research working on, on uh, relatively small scales and on phenomena that work at seasonal and sub-seasonal scales uh, to affect uh, populations and food, and, and food security and people um, immediately and in the now, and I'll sort of explain that. And also about looking at you know, going from multi-decadal climate change to looking at climatic events. Uh, that happen at, in the annual, seasonal, or even smaller time scales, and, and really trying to learn from each crisis that's happening, how can we adapt to and prepare for climate change um, as these crises become more frequent and worse, and et cetera, and you know, hence, my, hence my title with the crises and stuff. So, so we can all just go home now, or, but there's, they gave us free drinks and stuff, so I might as well, just, I might as well finish, right? Okay, all right, all right. I'll, I'll go through the slides. Okay, so um, at the Computation Institute, uh, we started our, our Global Change Research Program in 2008. If you'll recall, 2008 was a very exciting time. Uh, new administration heading into Washington. National and even global climate change policy was inevitably just around the corner. And the only question was, how do we design the optimal policy that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions fast enough, but without uh, unduly slowing economic growth, without um, you know, reducing job growth and et cetera. And so we at the Computation Institute built giant computational models as we do uh, to study global policy and global change and to, to address topics like um, the leakage of environmental pollution through national climate policies, the leakage of, of wealth and capital to unregulated countries if a, if a country tries to regulate carbon by itself. And we published a bunch of papers on this in economics journals. We even published one paper in a law journal, so we wanted to get the lawyers, the international tax lawyers, excited about, about carbon border tax adjustments and, 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 and carbon leakage and stuff. I don't know if they ever did. I, I think only David Weisbach got excited about it, but you know, it's easy to get him excited about things, so I don't think that was a huge win. We also um, were really interested. He's not here, is he? No, I don't think so. Okay, good. Um, uh, we, also, uh, we also were uh, really interested in studying different alternative energy technologies to look at which ones of these technologies were closest to that sweet spot in their cost curve where they could provide the, uh, the, the, you know, the most efficient way at reducing greenhouse gases um, in, in, the, in the cheapest way and getting us to a clean energy future as fast and as cheaply as possible. And this is actually where we first come across, came across studying agriculture um, through the topic of biofuels, working closely with folks um, at Argonne. Um, and we published a lot of papers on that, again, on how biofuels are going to affect food systems, how biofuels are affect land use change, um, competitions with food, and et cetera. Um, and uh, at, uh, we at RIDCEP, we still work on mitigation topics uh, because mitigation is really important. Um, if you want to avoid the truly devastating consequences of climate change over the long term, um, I apologize. This is a picture of New York City underwater. I couldn't find a picture of Chicago underwater, so <laughs> forgive me for the topical Miss, you know, for the locational mismatch, but I didn't, I didn't try very hard, but still, I, 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 didn't, I didn't find one, so I'll just uh. um, But we realized, um, so in 2010, in late 2010, um, I don't know if you'll remember this, but it started to look a little less likely that national uh, climate policy was going to get passed any time in the near future. Um, so we took uh, sort of a look at the pathway that the world was on, and we concluded that um, the world was really firmly on sort of the worst possible emissions pathway that you can imagine. And indeed, ever since then, we have stayed on that worst possible emissions pathway that's considered by uh, the IPCC. Um, and, uh, and, we, and we thought about it, and um, we concluded that we're really likely to stay on that path, really no matter what happens at this point, until at least about 2020. Um, now, all that extra CO2 in the atmosphere, that puts, traps extra heat in the Earth's system. 
that heat initially mostly goes into this giant, enormous heat sink we call the ocean, where it rattles around for a few decades before finally equilibrating with the atmosphere. So uh, what that means, effectively, is that, um, is that even if we stopped emissions now, even if we stabilized atmospheric CO2, it would take probably 30 to 40 years before global surface temperatures actually stopped rising. Um, so put another way, the, the sort of because of the inertia in the Earth system and because of the inertia in the, especially in the, so, in the economic and political systems, a large percentage of the climate change that we expect by, say, 2050 is really already baked into the system, and there's kind of nothing we can do about it at this point. Um, so we decided we needed to figure out how to maybe prepare for that, at least in, in some capacity. So we launched a new initiative through RIDSEP uh, that would eventually become our impacts group. Um, and we started off by, by trying to focus on issues of uh, food security, adapting to climate change in agriculture, and, and producing enough food uh, to feed the planet over the next, over the next decades. Um, in 2012, we joined a large international project with 40 other research groups from around the world to do the first ever model intercomparison project to synthesize knowledge on climate change impacts across a variety of different sectors. Uh, we led the agricultural sector for this, and what we found is a couple of robust things amidst a mass of uncertainty, uh, which is that um, um, on presently uh, harvested agricultural lands, climate change could mean anything from a 8 to a 45 percent reduction in productivity, uh, um, and, and that a lot of that negative productivity is happening in low latitude regions where food insecurity and indeed rapid population growth are already, you know, huge, huge problems, obviously. Um, and finally, also, that there are actually potentially big opportunities that are going to start emerging in the far northern uh, latitudes, like Canada, northern Siberia, and et cetera, that could compensate for these, but will, again, dramatically change the sort of uh, north-south distribution of, uh, of food production f even further. We also combine these results with a, uh, an ensemble of wa global water models uh, uh, from a group within the same project, because we wanted to look at how will fresh water availability over the next century impact, uh, in fact, the productivity of food. And what we found is that in dozens of uh, river basins around the world, the ones in the pink and red here, um, constraints in freshwater availability over the next many decades imply the reversion of between 20 and 60 million hectares of land from, from irrigated cropland to rain-fed cropland, which, it, which ends up equaling about uh, as big of a, a negative shock to to uh, agricultural productivity as the direct effects of climate change itself, so sort of doubling climate impacts, let's say. All right, so that was great. It was good. And climate change is really important. Climate change is going to make food, pro food production and productivity uh, much more challenging and complicated in the future. Um, but climate change is not the whole story. Uh, global change is a whole lot more than just you know, relatively uh, slow, steady changes in atmospheric conditions. Um, and, and in order to do a consistent sort of analysis of food security um, and, and, you know, hunger and health over even a, you know, multi-decadal time scale at all, you really need to take into account potentially dozens of other large-scale global forces associated with human influences and environmental externalities. Um, and so we set about to try and do that. And, and climate is not changing in a vacuum. I really like that, so I should say that out loud as well. So global what is global change? Well, global change is population growth, of course. Um, I'm going to use the laser backwards. No, global change is population growth. Global change is, is rapidly increasing wealth, and especially ch uh, changes in, the, in, the dis in disparities in how wealth is being distributed. Global change is rapidly increasing demand for meat and animal products, especially in those, in those increasingly wealthy households. Uh, global change is, is, is increasing extreme events, both uh, droughts and floods impacting impacting uh, uh, farmers around the world. It's also depleting freshwater resources, both surface and groundwater, which are drying up around the planet, both from overuse and from climate change. Global change is also deforestation and habitat loss um, and loss of species around the planet at really rapid and concerning rates. But then global change is also rapid technological growth, uh, which, is, um, which is, you know, has the potential to rapidly increase productivity, both in agriculture and in other sectors. Uh, it's also technology that, uh, that is providing us with new data and information that is allowing us to make better decisions about farm management and how to manage the environments uh, around farms and reduce, farm exter and reduce uh, external environmental externalities from farms. Um, and then finally, global change is also the sort of in innate human um, ability to adapt. 
um, and to take advantage of, of changes as they occur, including, including by growing crops in far frozen reaches of Manitoba that really have no business being there and even harvesting them while they still have snow all over them. Um, and a lot of these things, just like greenhouse gas emissions and just like climate change, a lot of these things are, are growing rapidly um, and, in fact, exponentially in many cases and, 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 and are really reaching regimes that are just well outside of anything we have any historical context for whatsoever. Um, and that's, that's troubling, just like it is with climate change and, and CO2. All right, so population, I'll just do, I'll just, I'll just do the easy ones. So population uh, is um, it's growing, continuing to grow, as everybody knows. It's projected to reach well over uh, 9 billion by 2050. Um, and at the same time, it's projected that per capita wealth and urbanization will also increase rapidly over that time, especially in the, in the developing countries. Um, at the same time, what we, we know that, that wealth, uh, increasing wealth, um, also drives an increasing demand for food calories and most importantly, an increasing demand for, the, for a fraction of those food calories to come from animal products. Um, so let's just take, for example, China, which is uh, in 2010 was about here at about 5,000 uh, US dollars per capita GDP and was consuming about 60 kilograms uh, of, of meat per capita. By, um, by 2050, China's expected to be about here at about 30,000 uh, US dollars per capita GDP and consuming almost double, uh, perhaps even double, uh, the meat consumption they consume now. So that means a country um, consuming per capita about as much meat as the average American, uh, but with four, maybe even five times as many people in it. Um, and um, this population growth, increasing meat consumption, and a lot of other factors that we know way too much about, like biofuels and everything else, and, um, and, 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 loss, of, and loss of agricultural land led led um, a United Nations panel in 2009 to say that food production by 2050 was going to have to double in order to meet growing demand and reduce hunger, hunger which is it's a, it's a really big number. I mean, I, we might not have good, I don't have, I don't even have good context for it, but doubling by 20, it's a really, it's a really, it's a lot. Um, when you add to that the fact that, um, that meat consumption is actually um, quite a lot more input intensive than, than production of other food pr products and that a lot of this growth is going to be in meat production. Um, that m further complicates the story. So it's estimated, depending on how you count it, that to produce one unit of, of, um, of, of protein from animal products requ uh, requires something like um, an order of magnitude more grain, uh, water, fossil fuels, and emissions compared to producing the equivalent amount of protein from vegetable products. So, so all of that together means that there's a huge amount of pressure now, growing amount of pressure on the demand side of the food system. At the same time that the stresses on the supply side from climate change um, are, are becoming more and more severe. And, and the likely outcome from that is, is more frequent and bigger disruptions to the global food system. And that can manifest either as domestic shocks um, in, um, in regions that have that, have, that are already food insecure and that don't have the abilities to go out on the global market to make up for, for local domestic shortfalls. Or it can, or it can manifest as, as, as production shocks in large breadbasket regions, uh, which affect global markets and global prices and have significant implications in regions that are import dependent because they don't have enough domestic capacity uh, to feed their own populations. And that includes um, you know, most Middle Eastern and North African countries um, and then here, of course, the best example is, you know, the continuing large-scale drought we're seeing right now in Ethiopia and, to a smaller extent, the drought we're seeing um, in India as well. All right, so um, then, uh, well, what can we do about it? So in 2014, um, we joined a task force called the UK-US Task Force on Extreme Weather and Global Food System Resilience to try and estimate uh, the scale and scope of this problem from continental to global scales. Uh, we used the uh, available data to estimate both what, are the, uh, what is the size of sort of a rare event shocks in both present and future climates, and looked at um, you know, whether and, ha and to what extent those shock sizes are likely to grow in future as climate grows. And um, the ultimate conclusion is that uh, the kind of event that in the 20th century we would have called a one in 100 year extreme shock event 
by the middle of the century is likely to occur something like once every 30 years. So a really kind of dramatic uh, acceleration in, in the frequency of these extreme food shock events. Um, so what are we going to so what, what are we going to do about it? Well, um, again, we're going to move to finer and finer scales, as I said, with our research products. So um, uh, right now at the CI, we're, our, our goal, um, you know, what, what, can, what can people do about these food shock events? Well, if, if farmers, if governments, if NGOs have advanced warning about these events before they occur, then they can chain, do extreme management practices. They can um, release food from reserves. They can change policies over on biofuels and other things um, to try and stem the effect that these events have on domestic on domestic uh, populations and on global markets. Um, so, what uh, the currently the, the the sort of tools that are available to help to to project these events in real time as they're happening operate at very coarse resolutions. They don't account for all the data that is available, and they and they're updated only at a very very low frequency. So. We're developing um, tools now at the CI that take advantage of some of our technologies to assimilate satellite data in real time at a high frequency that assimilate um, uh, both short and long-term climate forecasts from models run at NOAA and INCAR and other places uh, that assimilate soil and management and environmental data all through sort of high-resolution farm system models in order to produce real-time, accurate, um, um, high-frequency projections of how food production um, is likely to evolve, of how the harvest is likely to evolve throughout the season. Um, and this is just a random example that is fun, I won't really go into. And then finally, translating that all into, you know, large-scale, high-resolution maps for food insecure regions that can help to identify hotspots of, of, um, of, of potential sort of food insecurity before they emerge with anywhere from months to, you know, for any, with anywhere from weeks to potentially several months of lead time before the disasters actually strike. All right, so finally, um, we have reached the, the finest scale. So we started out with uh, using global, uh, global policy models, global trade models to model global policy and its impacts at the, at the global level. And we're now down to improving early warning and drought monitoring systems uh, before local up to like regional scales. Um, so where do we go next? Well, of course, the next step is that uh, we're going to apply these same tools at sub-farm level uh, using precision agriculture applications and at 10-meter resolution in order to try and help farmers increase productivity while simultaneously reducing uh, their fertilizer usage, reducing their irrigation usage, and improving both environment and productivity at the same time. But that is not a story for tonight. That's a story for next time whenever we have this food uh, related talk. So I'll just leave you with uh, this one picture of food from around the world. So this is four random families from four random countries and the food that they choose. Just to remind you that food is a choice and the choices that we make both as consumers and producers are really important and they impact things ar around the globe. So make good choices. Thank you. So all of the land and water resources are going that we need to grow vegetables and uh, food for people is going into feed for animals. And with all of the problems with water, soil degradation, uh, pesticide use, antibiotic resistance, etc., it seems like it just isn't sustainable and we have to do something about making people realize that. In order to solve the, the problem from the demand side, it requires a sort of a holistic view of food waste and diets and a lot of other things. Um, absolutely, you know, if everyone in America became vegetarian tomorrow, that would go a long way to solving the problem. But we also need to recognize that, that meat plays a very important cultural and nutritional role in a lot of parts of the world. So you, you can't just say meat is the problem. The, it's, you can pro it's probably safe to say that the, that the industrial meat industry in the Western world is largely unsustainable, or at least a large contributor to the problem of unsustainability. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But we, we need a solution. We can't really sort of blame it on, on one or another industry. We really need a solution that looks holistically at the food system, reduces waste, um, improves diets you know, across especially the developed world, um, and, and, and improves productivity um, all at the same time to sort of produce enough food for everyone. <laughs>